done a lot a lot of is the kind of practical parts right so I want to go back and maybe go over some of the the theory bits I thought I unfroze that maybe I didn't um, so go over some of the theory and kind of talk about the the Android platform as a whole as well as hit some of the things that that you may need to know as we go through so if you look under perusal there's a folder called slides um, all of these are in there um, I have made some tweaks since I actually loaded in to perusal so there will be some differences between what's up there in perusal and what I have here um, but those should be those are the originals um, no so um, that's that's where we're at this is mostly going to be theory stuff okay. Is that clear? So, so definitely pull up notes, piece of paper, Word document, whatever, to make sure that you have a place to to write down notes, because um, this is this is more the the theoretical side of things. Okay. So, what's in this first set of slides is we're going to be talking about well, what's the Android ecosystem? How what's the architecture of the Android platform? Uh, what are some of the version numbers that are out there? We've already seen that a little bit, so I won't spend too much time there. Um, and then talking about what are some of the challenges with making Android apps that we have to deal with. Um, and then talking about some of the fundamentals. So first, the Android ecosystem. So the Android Android's based on top of the Linux kernel. You may have heard of Linux before. It's another operating system. And it's sort of semi-loosely connected to Unix, but is freely available. It's open source, and it's been long maintained by a guy named Linus Torvalds, who originally created it. Okay. Um, historically, it's been used on most of our servers. Um, that's where the primary use of it has been. But going back 90s, early 2000s, most of our servers were actually running Linux, even though Windows was the primary operating system for most end users, if that makes sense. Um, but now it underlies all of our Linux funds. And in some cases, some ways, um, there's also a very similar sort of basis um, with even Mac products, in fact, because a lot of Mac products at the lowest level, they're based on, if I remember, FreeBSD, which is very similar to Linux in many ways. So if you got down to the command line between a Mac machine and the command line on a Linux kernel, Linux machine, you'd see that they're very similar. Or a Linux on a desktop versus a Linux command line on your Android device, there's a lot of similarities there at the lowest level. Okay. User interface is entirely designed for touchscreens. Um, yes, keyboard and mouse support is actually built into Android, but that's not our primary market. Right, our primary market is touch screens. Um, used on about 80% of all smartphones nowadays. They've taken over most of the market there. It's also used on watches, TVs, cars. Um, so that's that's one thing to keep in mind. You can actually deploy Android apps to things that aren't just phones and tablets. Does the Nintendo Switch also run on Android? It may. I haven't heard. I haven't heard that for sure. Um, but that would be an interesting thing if it did. Um, so we've got about, at least at the time these slides were made, there's over 200, 2 million Android apps on the Google Play Store. Um, and then there's just a lot of customizability that goes into that. Um, just like Linux is open source, the core part of Android is as well. Um, there are some things that are built on top of that that are not. So like Google's got several services and pieces that are built on top of Android that aren't actually open source. That makes sense. So while Android operating system as it, uh, as it stands, that is open source, the Play Store isn't, right? The, the, the Play Store app is not an open source app, okay? Um, as far as gestures, you can, you can, you can, First, interacting with an Android device, primarily through gestures, swiping, you've seen, um, tapping, which is basically the equivalent of clicking, and you've got pitch, pinching, which you're going to do for, for zooming and, and zooming out usually. Um, it does have support for virtual keyboards, 
those can have characters, numbers, emojis. That's an important thing to keep in mind is you can put emojis in on your keyboards now, and that may affect your code in some places. Um, most of them support Bluetooth. Some of them also support USB and other peripherals. So for instance, you can actually get um, well, Bluetooth and USB keyboards that potentially can be used with phones or tablets, as well as being able to get controllers and things like that. Um, other sensors exist on the device. Um, so there are um, what we call accelerometers that can measure how your device is tilted, and that's how it knows to change orientation as you move it around, is it uses those accelerometers. Um, you'll also see um, compasses and gyros in there as well for measuring orientation. Those are really helpful, especially if you ever wanted to do anything with AR. You really have to have all of those there to do good AR. You have to have an accelerometer, gyro, and a compass, as well as the GPS stuff. So, you know, you've got GPS, which can adjust, say, hey, you're looking at the map app. That goes into there. You've got tilting, again, accelerometers. The big thing to remember there is the is that the screen is not the only thing you can interact with or get input in from an Android device. Does that make sense? There's a lot of other peripherals or sensors that can be used to generate interaction. Okay. So every app that you build is going to have a launcher icon, um, and you'll see those show up on your home screen. Um, they're also on they're also on some phones. You may have seen something we call a widget. Okay. The most common widget that you're going to see is say your clock, right? If you've got a clock on your home screen, right? There's an app behind that, but that clock is not the launcher icon, right? That clock is what we call a widget. So actually in Android, there's two completely separate ideas, both of which are called widgets, unfortunately. Okay, so when you're looking through through documentation, you do have to kind of be aware of that there's two different definitions. So the first definition widget is something that appears on your home screen. Okay, something that you can use on one of your home screen panes. Okay, that's a widget. Um, you also see referred to any control you have in your app is also a widget, right? But those are obviously not the same thing. Does that make sense? So there's there's two things that can be called widgets in the documentation, but they're not necessarily the same item. So again, the home screen can have multiple pages that you kind of tap through having folders and having that okay Google. So you've got some example apps. Most of these you're probably familiar with. Pandora, Pokemon Go, Facebook Messenger. Obviously they do very different things, but they still run on the same hardware. Um, so a key part of what we're working with is something we call the Android Software Development Kit. Um, that's already pre-bundled with Android Studio. Um, in order to do any Android development whatsoever, you have to have that SDK. Okay, But that SDK you can get on any operating system, actually. Um, but you do have to have that in order to work. Now... That SDK includes things like ADB, which is what you're actually using anytime you want to send a, send a, send an app over to your device, um, and it's also what sends logcat back and logcat messages back and forth. It's it's a critical part of that whole system, right? So you remember we looked at previously we went into the SDK manager, right, and we updated things, right? So that's one part of that. So Android Studio is built on top of this SDK. Does that make sense? So let's say I was building, let's say I'm building a, a game in Unity, right? Well, I don't need Android Studio, but I do still need the SDK. Because again, anything you do with Android, you have to have this SDK, regardless of what other tools you're using. So that includes a lot of libraries. That's where the emulators are actually contained. They're actually part of Android's, they're not so much part of Android Studio as they are part of the SDK. Okay, also includes some documentation and some sample code. So Android Studio, you've gotten some intro to. Um, the Google Play Store is obviously where you're going to deploy your apps if you want anybody to ever, if you want somebody else to be able to actually use them and download them. 
Okay. Um, that's the official one that's produced by Google. You will know perhaps that there's a few other app stores out there now. Um, so for instance, if you have a, a Amazon Fire device of any sort, you'll notice that they have a different Play Store. You can get the Google Play Store on Fire devices, but they by default come with a different um, app store. So given that, Kind of cursory information about the ecosystem. We want to talk about the Android framework as a whole. Okay, now this is pretty low level. Um, for a lot of the stuff we're doing right now, you may not necessarily care about all these layers that are here. Um, but as you get deeper into the world of Android, and as you start working with some of the sensors and Bluetooth devices and YouTube. USB devices, or you end up working with the console, you may care about all of these levers beneath it. Okay. So at the top level, we have system apps and we have user apps. Okay. Can anybody tell me what the difference between those two is? What's a user app? What's a system app? A user app is built by a user. Not really, because it depends on how you define user. Okay. Again, you need a better definition. Are system apps apps that are required for the operating system to run? Generally, yes. Generally, yes. So. Most system apps, all, all system apps are going to be pre-installed on your device. Okay. Now, the, 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 the apps that are pre-installed are actually usually a mix. So some of them will be system apps, some of them will be user apps. Okay. Um, user apps generally is anything that you can download from the Play Store. Right. So it's anything that's been developed by a, you know, these have been developed by developers, right? That are developing really apps. The system apps are written by the man, generally written by the manufacturer of your phone. Does that make sense? So, for instance, if you've got a Samsung device, you're going to have several system apps that have been built by Samsung. If you have an HTC device, you're going to have several system apps that are built by HTC. Okay. Now, the diff, one of the differences that, that happens here, and we'll go through many more of this in. In, in a second. Uh, first of all, they're stored in two different places on your phone. They're stored in different folders. System apps are stored in one place, user apps are stored in another. Um, but they also get access to more permissions. So there are a lot of things that system apps can do and have permission to do that your user apps cannot. Okay. You may, you, I'm sure you've downloaded apps before and you've seen that, that prompt that says, can you want to allow the user to do this A, B, and C? Okay. There's a list of those permissions that any app on the Play Store can ask for. But then there's also a list of permissions in there that only system apps can get. Does that make sense? So on top of that layer of apps, all of those apps are built in either Java or Kotlin. Okay, but they all run on the Java virtual machine. So beneath that, we've got the Java API frameworks, right? So in here, we've got mixed in all of those core Java classes like list and integer and string and map. All of those things are in this. But we've also got in that Java API framework, we've got all the Android-specific classes like activity and view and text view, right? So all of this, this top layer here, that's still Java, right? All of this that we've got in those top two layers, we're working entirely in Java, okay? Then what you've got beneath that is these two parts. So first of all, we got the Android runtime, right? That's our Android, our Java virtual machine, right? The Java virtual machine is what actually runs all the code up here, okay? What runs all the code up here? We also got mixed in here some native libraries that have been written in C or C++. Okay, so those are things like I want to talk to a Bluetooth device. Well, if I want to talk to a Bluetooth device, there's a Bluetooth library that lives in here. 
But if I want to do anything with the network, I want to go download this web page. Well, there's libraries in here that deal with using a network, right? If I want to plug in a USB device, whether it be a flash drive or a keyboard into the USB port, again, it has to go through one of these libraries. Does that make sense? So there's a lot of standard libraries that are built there and bundled with your phone. Now, for the most part, we don't interact directly with these. Okay? In most cases, we do not directly act, interact with those native platforms. So most of the time, we'll go through a Java API up here that talks to those. So, for instance, if we want to deal with Bluetooth, we don't need to directly talk to the Bluetooth library here. We talk to the Bluetooth library up here in the Java API. Does that make sense? It standardizes a few things, and that means we don't have to cross that bridge between managed code, which is what we would have left in here, right, where everything we build is garbage collected, versus unmanaged and the rubber pointers that goes down here. So, but there are places where you may, at some point, let's say you wanted to do some 3D rendering, right? Well, a 3D rendering is based on something called OpenGL, which lives down here. So, for doing some 3D rendering and doing, for doing 3D rendering or doing things that involve augmented reality, say, there's a lot of reasons why you may need to get down here. Okay. Um, beneath that, we've got this hardware extraction layer, right? So this hardware extraction layer, well, there's a lot of differences between all of our smartphones that we have, all the tablets. There's a lot of differences in how the hardware is built and manufactured. Uh, and put together. So we want to hide a lot of those differences. Does that make sense? So this this layer helps us get to a point where it looks roughly like the hardware for all the devices is basically the same. Right? So that removes a lot of those hardware differences. This is where that comes in. And then at the very lowest level down here, that's where we finally get to Linux. So all of this stuff is built on top of Linux. Does that make sense? The lowest level, here's the Linux code. Okay. So like we mentioned previously, most of your system apps are going to kind of be pre-installed. Um, and a lot of times they're going to provide some of those fundamental capabilities that you need to even be able to use your phone. Right? So for instance, all of your, all the phones come within a messaging app, right? You want to send out text messages or you want to make phone calls, well, you need a system app to do that. Does that make sense? If you want to be able to get to the Play Store, well, the, the Play Store is usually a system app as well, right? To be able to download and update things. Okay. Now, let's take a quick look at this article because it does do a good job of explaining some of the differences between system and user apps because there are some important differences. So in the Android in the in the Android architecture, if you look down to the file system, um, there are a few files that we folders that we care about. Okay. So under under the Android file system, we have one folder. We call it slash system. Now, because Android is based on Linux, there's not this concept of drive letters that we have on Windows. Make sense? So we don't have drive letters in Linux. We just start, we want to say, you want to be at the root, think kind of your C drive, that's slash. Just the single slash is root, right? So this, what I'm saying here, is the system folder under root. Okay. Um, we also have a folder called data. Okay. Pretty much everything we care about is in one of those two folders. Okay. Everything that we care about on, on the Android operating system is going to be in one of those two folders. Um, there are more folders, but those are the only ones that we really care about. Okay. Now under system, there may be one of two folders. It may be slash app or it may be 
slash private app. Depends on what version of Android you're running. And some version of Android may have both. Okay. So this is where system apps are stored. They're going to either be stored in system app or system private app. Okay. User apps are stored down here under the app folder and the data folder. Um, you also usually have a data data. So under the data folder, you've got your app folder, you've got your data folder, your user apps are stored here. Any data for those apps is in stored in data data. Okay. So one of the things that means is that's if we want something, so that's that's how it determines whether it's a system app or it's a user app. Okay. One of the rules about these two, in general, anything that's under the system folder, system is generally read only, so I can't make any changes to that that folder. In fact, it's it's actually what we would consider a partition, right? So if you think about how we've got our drive letters, right? And if you've done enough with computers, you may know that you can partition a drive into multiple drives, right? Kind of treat one drive as multiple drives. Well, that's what happens here. So system is effectively a completely separate drive from data. Even though they're the same hardware, but they're, they're treated as a separate drive. Okay, so this is read-only. Okay, you can't make changes to that unless you have root, root access. Okay. Um, also means that I can't read or means I can't read or write there, right? So any system apps I cannot uninstall. Unless you have root, you cannot uninstall those apps. So if you ever go into an app on your phone and say, I want to uninstall it, maybe that button that uninstall app is grayed out. That inherently means it's a system app. If it's a user app, you can uninstall it. If it's a system app, you cannot. That makes sense. It also means because these are pre-apportions as drives, as basically as, as as separate drives or partitions, the space for this is pre-allocated. So this may be on your device is pre-allocated as 300 megs. It can't get any bigger or smaller than that. Does that make sense? So there's space that's always been preserved. There's always preserved space for the system. Partition. Okay. Um, when you have updates to system apps, because this part is read only, the original app that shipped with your device is always here, but the actual updates to that app are over here. So, for instance, the, the Play Store, right, which is shipped as a system app, okay, the original version that you got when you bought when the phone was made lives in here in system app that's the original version the current version of the app lives in data app that makes sense current version of the app is here the original version is there for user apps it's just always in data okay does that make sense so that's where if you have something say you go to try and uninstall the play store well you won't be able to uninstall it but you will be able to remove updates, all the updates since it was originally released. Because it can go back to that. Okay. Um, so it also, again, anything that lives in that system folder that's a system app has additional permissions, it has additional things that it can do. Those permissions have changed over time. Um, and in general, they've become more restricted. Um, so there were something earlier, early in, let's say, Android 2.0, there were several <coughs> things that you could download an app from Play Store and it could do. Um, but that's been kind of trimmed down so that there's a lot of those permissions that used to be available aren't now. That makes sense? That's where it may affect us. So that's the big thing that you need to know is there are some permissions that are out there and depending on what version of, of Android your user is using, what version of Android their device is,
they may be able to have that permission or they may not be able to have that permission. Okay. Again, updates we talked about, those are always put onto the data part. Um, there's also an option in Android and newer versions is that you, in order to free up space on your device, you can move an app, you can move an app and its data over to an SD card. That makes sense? So there's built-in memory space that's built into the device. And then there's this, the SD cards that you can plug in to get additional space. Okay, so you can go into the operating system and say, hey, I want to move this app and this data over to the SD card. Well, that's generally only available for user apps. Generally, system apps, you can't move off of the main built-in memory. Does that make sense? So there are things there that can affect you. Um, and you just want to keep some of those things in mind. Because they can affect you both as a developer and as a, a user for Android. Okay. So the API framework, as I mentioned earlier, that's the huge set of classes that we can use to build our apps with. That's that whole class hierarchy, including the classes that we get from Java, including the classes that we get from, from Android. Okay. Things in there, for instance, if we want to do notifications, there's a notification manager class. Um, so we, we'll need to work with that. If we want to do things with activities and switching screens and, and dealing with their life cycle, navigation, all of that, again, we're going to be interacting with the Java API framework. Okay. So there's a link here. This is how you can get to it. I think I showed you earlier in the course. But if you follow through um, developer.com references packages, you'll find a reference to every single class that exists in the Java API. And you can even filter it by what version of the API you're looking at. Then beneath that, we've got the Android runtime. Um, that's the actual VM, the actual virtual machine that our Java code runs on. Um, and in there, every different app is treated as its own process. Make sense? Its own process. You may have remembered me talking about that earlier, maybe in a previous semester. Remember, when you're dealing with programs on a computer, You've got this idea of processes and threads, right? So a process is effectively a running program. Um, and it means that also it, it, any process you have can't share memory with another process. So your, your app that's running over here, your app A, can't use the same memory as app B is using. That makes sense? They can't get access to each other's variables. That's what that means practically. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of core C, C++ libraries um, that give us access to very low level parts of the Android operating system um, and give us additional services to work with, say, Bluetooth and network resources and, and the like. Okay. Um, also, newer on a newer note there too, know that most, most phones have fingerprint scanners now, right? Well, there's a C++ library that has to handle that at some point, right? So at some point, there's a there's a native library for your fingerprint scanner. Um, now, if you're interacting with that with your app, you're going to use it at the API level, but know that that, a, that Android, the Java API, has to call back down into the C++ API. So we've got the the hardware extraction layer, which deals with camera, Bluetooth, etc. We've got the Linux kernel down all the way at the bottom, which actually deals with managing the processes, managing threads, um, managing the actual memory. Um, that's where that happens, as well as certain security features are built in at that level. Um, so like security features of, I can't 
this this app A can't access the files of app B. Well, that's all the way down at the Linux side. File permissions are all the way down there. And drivers may be in there as well for dealing with other devices. Okay, so Android versions, as I mentioned previously, all of them have a code name. They have a version number, which is the nice marketing version number that you'll see usually what we talk about, but we also have the API level, which is what we formally use to define support. Okay. You know, is this going to work on this version of Android, or is it going to work on that version of Android? We're going to go by the API level. Okay. So the devices you have, as you've seen, they're running Pi, also known as 9.0, also known as API 28. But what we're supporting down to is 5.0, which as you can see, was released in 2014. So we're going back, with what we're supporting, we're going back six years. Um, and this is, you can kind of see, probably don't need to go back to API 20, go, go back to 15, because 15 was released in, back in 2011. Probably didn't know, need to go back nine years as far as actually supporting older devices. So that's why I'm setting that as, as just 21. Does that make sense? Six years is already a big slew of, of things to cover, let alone nine years of changes. OK. So an Android, what is an Android app? Android is composed of one or more interactive screens. As you've kind of seen, we've built activities, right? So every screen in your app is what we call an activity. Okay, does that make sense? There's a one-to-one -one relationship between screens and activities. Okay, they're written in a combination of Java and XML. So you've seen your, your main part of your code, your, your business logic, we're going to write that in Java, and the view parts, the resources, all that front-end stuff is going to be in XML. We're going to find those resources in XML. We're going to use the SDK, we're going to use the Android libraries, um, and that's all going to be running on that application, the, the Android virtual machine, or ART, as it's now known. Um, again, used to be called Dalvik. Older versions of Android are still running Dalvik. Newer versions of Android, it's called ART. Okay. This is probably the most important slide that I want you to pay attention to on this deck. Um, is what are the challenges that we need to be thinking about and solving as we're building Android apps, okay? First and foremost one is recognize there are a lot of different kinds of Android devices, right? Ranging from four inches up to 10 inches is kind of that normal range of tablets and smartphones. But we've also got smartwatches now, which are even smaller than four inches. And we've got TVs, right? Which usually have a pretty low resolution, relatively speaking, but are physically larger, right? Um, so there's a lot of range to how your app might be used and what you may need to design for, which means that you really have to think about how can I make it work well on different screen sizes, right? So if you think, hey, four inches to 10 inches, well, that's one thing. What about from a smartwatch to a 32 inch TV, right? I think there may be some things you have to change between what it does on the smartwatch and what it does on the TV, right? Reasonably speaking. Um, and this is, this is a lot of, because of the different screen sizes, it's a big reason why you see a lot more complexity built into the way we design Android apps. Does that make sense? So what made sense, let's say, going back to the world of Windows Forms, right? Windows Forms, drag and drop, we didn't really worry about sizing it to different screens, right? But here we've got a break where we say, well, let's break the activity out. You know, let's break our business code out. Let's have our layout. And then let's have multiple versions of the layout, right? So one version of the layout that works for a portrait, one that works for a landscape, have different variations for different tablets. Have, we might have a smartphone variation of the, sorry, a smartwatch variation of the layout, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And you've also seen we've got the strings file, we've got the colors file, you've seen the demands file that we just added yesterday. You remember that? 
So all of that is really to take into account all of these different screen sizes that we need to handle, as well as all the different languages we need to handle, right? So that's why Android's kind of designed the way it is. A lot of it has to do with dealing with different screen sizes. Okay. Another important thing to think about as you're working along, performance matters, right? Because most smartphones maybe aren't running the fastest chips, right? There's a lot of smartphones and a lot of tablets that don't necessarily have a very fast processor. They don't necessarily have a lot of memory, okay? So you do have to keep performance in mind. That being said, um, it's not nearly as limiting as it used to be. Um, most, most devices are pretty fast. Um, but it does skew a little bit depending on how expensive your device is, right? So if I get, let's say, uh, an Amazon Fire that's like a $50 tablet, right? Versus I get the newest Samsung smartphone, right? These are going to have two very different performance metrics, right? It might work fine on the on the, the fancy new flagship phone that you paid eight hundred dollars for, but it might not work well on the fifty fifty dollar device. So you always want to be thinking about that and make sure as you're testing it, make sure you're testing Android devices both with with lower end as well as higher end devices. Okay. Um, security is an important thing um, as things have kind of gone on. Um, it's the big thing that we hear about in the news nowadays when it comes to Android, right, is all the security issues, right? So the biggest thing in there, what's our, what's our biggest hurdle? Well, we want to keep the user's data safe, right? And so there are some security measures on the actual phone that take care of that, right, that help keep the data safe on the phone. Um, However, that being said, mostly the, the trouble comes with, okay, at some point I need to ship the data off to a web server somewhere, right? And now how safe is that database? So usually the, the point of security is actually over on the website that you're talking to, um, less so than it is the actual device. But security still matters as far as the devices are concerned, especially when it comes to GPS data, right? You don't necessarily want anybody to be able to get access to your location, right? And there's a lot of nefarious things that you can do if you have access to a location or have access to somebody's camera, right? Those are probably the two most dangerous permissions out there. Um, the other thing you may want to do from a security standpoint is you may want to keep your source code safe. So let's say I push something out to the app store, right? I don't necessarily want anybody that downloads my app to then get all the code from my app. Does that make sense? I don't necessarily want that to happen. Okay. Now, if you know anything about Java, remember when we built the classes using the command line, I took a source file and I said Java C compiled it to a class file. Okay. Those class files are not encrypted in any sort of way. And in fact, they're very easy to reverse engineer. Um, it's actually very easy to take a set of class files and decompile them back into the original source code. That's actually really, really easy. Um, it's surprising how easy and how, how much you keep there. You lose all the comments, um, but actually you keep everything else. Generally speaking, if you don't do anything with it. Okay. So if you ever go to publish your app on the internet, um, one of the tools that we use is something called an obfuscator, um, which will take that code that you're writing and in the compilation project will change it up in such a way that it's a lot harder to decompile. Does that make sense? So there's something already built in and you may actually see a configuration file for, it's called ProGuard. That's what we use to investigate the code once we have actually deploy it to the Play Store. That, that prevents other people that just download our app from immediately getting all the code that's in it. Um, it's still not a perfect thing. So for instance, if you have a URL in there to your website, they're still going to be able to get that. Okay. If you have any passwords in the middle of your app, they're still going to be able to get that. Um, 
but it means that they can't necessarily take your app and then make another version of it and put it on the app store. That makes sense. So that's another thing that we need to think about as we're working through. Um, compatibility is also an issue. Recognize that the first Androids, Android phones hit the market in 2011, right? So we're talking about nine years of, of devices that have been put out by a bunch of different companies. And what works on one, the, what the API was back in 2011, the Android API is not what it is today, right? So we do have to, we do have to think about compatibility among all those different Android versions, as well as there are some things that you have to look at in terms of who made it. Um, so an HD phone, HTC phone might not work the same way that a Samsung does. Uh, a Google Nexus might not work the same way as a, a Samsung HTC. They all have their little differences. Um, and the deeper you go into the world of Android, the closer you get to that Linux kernel, the more differences you see. That makes sense? The lower level you go, the more you see differences. So as long as we can stay up with the higher level and the Android API, that helps hide a lot of those differences. Does that make sense? But that's something we have to think about. Um, marketing in terms of apps, if you ever want to release your own app, it's something you got to think about. It doesn't necessarily have to cost a lot of money, but it, it is something that comes in there. Um, as well as how do you make money once it's out there. Um, especially with there being so many million of those apps on the market, it's really hard to get that to a user. Does that make sense? So you make an app, eventually you'd like to get it into your user's hand. That, that's a challenge in and of itself um, to stand out in the crowd. But the big thing to pay attention to is we need to support those different screen sizes. That's the thing that we'll spend probably the most time in this course with, is dealing with all the differences that go into, hey, there's different screen sizes. Um, that affects us in a lot of ways. Okay. Um, building blocks that we have for building up apps. We've got resources. Um, so you kind of see we've already made layouts. You can add in images, you can add in strings, you can add in colors, and a lot of this stuff is we're going to use XML files to manage. Okay. Different components that go into an app. So you've seen your first few activities. Um, the more advanced apps, well, we're obviously going to have more than one activity. Um, there's also something we'll talk about, which is called which are called services. Services are a way to run code in the background, namely to run code when the user's not interacting with your app. Okay, so activities are entirely for the user wants to do something with your app. Services are for running things in the background when your user's not there. That makes sense. And then there's also a bunch of helper classes additionally kind of in there. Um, the manifest, which you've seen, again, is that one of the most important files in your app which says, hey, here's everything that's in my app and where to find it and configures it and kind of ties things together. Um, so that's an important thing to pay attention to. Um, we also have the Gradle files, which configure the build, configure how your app is built. Okay. So there's a bunch of links here as far as more things you can read to find out more about Android as a whole. Um, let's go ahead and take a quick break here and come back at 1.45. Okay. A similar way. What do you mean the same one? Like they just used it directly, just like used it. Android, how Android, whatever Android user renders its UI, they just use the same thing. I find that hard to believe, but okay. I'm sure there's similarities, but it's probably yeah. probably some differences. Um, I have a dentist appointment today. Uh -huh. to um, so for the weekend, are you gonna oh, for the rest? Let me just that. So we were we finished up with lesson 1.0. <laughs>
Um, I want to get going now with lesson 1.2. So we're going to talk about some some layouts and the resources, some of how to work with the UI. Is that in the same place? It's the same place, but now I'm on the 1.2 deck. Um, so everything in Android, as far as what we're looking visually in our apps, is going to be broken up into to views and view groups. And those are kind of archa architected in something we call the view arc hierarchy or the, the layout hierarchy. Okay. Um, we've seen a little bit of how to use that layout editor. Primarily, we're going to be using constraint layout. And you can see that's what initially all your empty activities are going to start with a constraint layout because that's the, the recommended layout engine now. Um, we also talked briefly about handling events and then working with resources and measurements. Okay, so first of all, views. Um, again, everything that you see on the device is a view. So the buttons are views, the, the labels are view, if I had an ed input area, that would be a view, right? So we have three different views on this app here. Okay. So view gives us that basic building block for anything we want to do with the user interface. We've got ones that display text, which is that text view that displays text in a way that's not editable by the user, right? Or we can use an edit text if we want the user to actually be able to edit that text or type in their own text. So that's what we're going to see like the soft keyboard is anytime you have an edit text. Um, you can also add buttons, menus, there's other things in there. If we need something to be scrollable, um, we have two options nowadays that we can use. We can have the scroll view, which we've already looked at yesterday, and that allows you to make a single thing scrollable or a group of things. Um, or you can use what's called a recycler view. Now, a recycler view is really good for displaying a list of things in a scrollable fashion. And part of the way it works and part of why it's called recycler view is as you're scrolling things up and down, it does that by dynamically adding and removing things. So let's say you're scrolling down, well, what's, what's happening? Well, things are disappearing up off the top, right? So those things get deleted, new things get created at the bottom. Well, what it does is it recycles or reuses the controls that go off the top and pulls them back up to the bottom. Does that make sense? So it's pretty clever with how it works there, and it's actually an easy way to think. So it works for hundreds and, and thousands of items, even though maybe you're only seeing 10 items at a time. Okay. We'll also look at the image view at some point in this first unit to deal with showing images. We've seen the constraint layout and the linear layout for showing groups of controls and putting them together and arranging them. General controls on Android. These are some of the most common ones. So we've got buttons. We've got edit text, like a text field like this. They always have some sort of way to specify that this is the area. So usually there's a line underneath. Um, and sometimes that line has little bits at the end. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, it can take a lot of different kinds of text. So there's a lot of different versions or modes that you can put an edit text in. So we'll, we'll see that in a few lessons. Um, there's also sliders. Um, so you can slide this left and right and say, hey, maybe I want to pick a number from 0 to 100 um, and things like that. You kind of think of maybe a volume slider that comes in. Um, you've also got checkboxes and radio buttons, just like you're familiar with. But there's an additional one that maybe you, you haven't seen in, in web sites, which is the switch. Okay. So it's getting an off or on state. So conceptually, a switch and a checkbox are basically the same thing. They're just a different way of displaying it. Does that make sense? Is one easier or harder to work with? No, nope, they're both about the same. And if I remember right, they're both a subclass of the same parent class. I think if I remember right, uh, switch checkbox and radio button are all subclasses of the checked button class. So they work very similar. Yes. So switch is off or on, right? Which is 
basically a checkbox. It just looked it just looks differently. So it depends on kind of what you're trying to communicate to the user. You can you can always use a checkbox or a switch interchangeably, um, but they may have they may mean something different to your user if that makes sense. Um, so different attributes that all of our views have. They've got colors, they've got dimensions. We can position them. Um, they can either have focus or, or not have focus. Yes? I just had another question about that. Um, like, uh, <clears throat> I guess in uh, C Sharp Power, I guess there's a dash check or something like that. There's a similar there's a similar method, but remember that there are no properties in Java, so it will be a method, right? Mm -hmm. So it'll be like get checked, get checked. or is checked. So it's, the same thing. it's the same method actually, because okay. because it comes from the parent class, mm -hmm. the checkbox and the switch have the same parent class. Okay. So and as far as code's concerned, they work the same. They're just a different name of the class. They're just rendered differently. Um, so they can have they can have focus or they cannot have focus. So there are you may want to have some of your controls can get focus, some of them can't. Um, so for instance, you usually would set a text view to not be able to be focusable, and then like an edit field, an edit text would be focusable. Okay. Now focus on Android on touch screens is a little bit of a tricky business, right? So if I'm working on a laptop or a desktop, how do I usually change focus? I can click, okay. And and clicking still I can still effectively click on a on a device by tapping. Um, but what was the other one? You said tabbing, right? Is there a tab key on any Android device that you've seen? No, tap key doesn't exist. At least not as a hardware button. Okay, so there's no tab key on phones, which means that you can't change focus by hitting tap. Although there sort of is. Um, so if you've ever tried to fill out a form on your phone, you'll know that you know that enter key, it changes, right? So normally, if you had a normal keypad in the layout, you'd have a little enter key in the bottom right. But if you've used enough websites or apps, you'll notice that sometimes it's actually a tab key and sometimes it's an enter key. Um, so in fact, Android will automatically figure out that. So we'll kind of figure out what order your controls are in. And all of the controls that are not the last one on the page, um, it'll make it a tab button. And then the last one, it will turn it into a go button effectively. It'll tell it to go do what action or action is. So depending on what properties you set, it may say, it may be a search button, it may be a submit button, it may be whatever, but it'll dynamically change that enter key based on what control you're on. Um, so there sort of is a tab key on Android devices. It's just a, it's just a soft key. Um, the other thing to know there you can do shift tab on a, you remember to go backwards in the, the tab cycle, you can do shift tab on a, on a keyboard. There's not really a shift tab on Android. So you can go forward, but it's a lot harder to go backward. So that's another thing to think about as you're building up your UIs is tabbing still matters. And you have to think about the people that are using like a Bluetooth keyboard, um, but, a lot of times you have to think about the touch input first. Okay. Um, you can also have app, have views or controls that are interactable, so the user can click on them or do things with them, and other ones that are maybe not. Um, you can have controls that are visible and not visible. Um, in fact, in Android, there's three different states of visibility, which we'll get to later. Um, so there's there's on the one side, they're completely gone. On the other side, they're visible. But there's also a kind of a state in between. Um, and specifically, I think we've got visible, which they're always there. We've got invisible, which they're hidden, but the space is still reserved. And then you've got gone, which means that they're not visible and their space is bad. Um, 
collapsed. They're out of the layout hierarchy. Um, so when we actually look at visibility, you've got to recognize that it's kind of on a three states instead of two states. Um, we also can have relationships between the different views, and that's where we're doing things like having constraints <coughs> to say, this view needs to be underneath that one, or the left or to the right of another view. So those relationships matter as well. So we're going to create those views, we're going to create those layouts primarily through XML. And we can either do that visually through the designer, or we can modify the XML co code directly. It's also actually technically possible to create controls through Java code, and you'll see that in this lecture. Um, I would advise against doing that most of the time because it's a lot less configurable than doing it in XML. So for instance, if you do it in, in Java code directly, you don't get all the benefits of it figuring out, oh, you're in or landscape or you're in portrait. You have to do all that logic yourself. So while you can do that, I would advise against doing that wherever possible. And it's usually possible to get around that. So if we look at the layout editor, we've kind of seen that already, so I'm going to skip past that. We look at the XML for a text view. You'll see that it's kind of structured this way. So we've got the opening tag. We've got the slash greater than that's at the end. And in the, in the interim, we've got a bunch of properties or attributes, right? So we've got a bunch of settings that we've set. Okay. And you'll see that all of them start with some sort of prefix. So like this is Android colon ID, Android colon text. All of the, those prefixes are what we call namespaces, XML namespaces. So if you look at the top of the layout file, you'll see a bunch of lines that say like XMLS, NS, colon, Android, right? So that says these particular properties and tags come from this style sheet. Schema. What were you going to say? I was going to say, so would the layout be part of the attribute or would it be the entire thing? The whole thing, right? So this whole thing from the beginning to the end, that's one attribute. Okay. So the name of the attribute is layout width. It comes from the Android namespace. So that's the namespace that has this attribute that populates the plane. And then you have the value after the so you'll see things like Android and app and tool as different namespaces that get used. And that basically has to do with where those properties come from. Okay. Now, as long as you're working with designer, it will automatically figure out those namespaces for you. Uh, but if you're doing it with code, you'll need to know those kind of things. So some examples of what you might see there. So for instance, if we want to just say, Set the width. We're going to say Android on layout width is equal to match parent. So we just got straight up a fixed value in there. Does that make sense? So here I'm literally putting the value in the XML. Okay. I can also reference the it reference resources. So here I'm saying Android text string button label text. So I'm saying that this string is actually somewhere else. So I'm using a resource, right? So anytime you see this app. You're going to see at the type of resource it is, and then what the ID of the resource is. Right? So in this case, it's a string. If you saw at drawable, well, that means it's a drawable resource. If you see at color, well, that means it's a color resource. Okay? So usually the place you're going to find those is either in values. That value, say I want to find color, it's going to be values colors. If I want to find a string, it's going to be values strings. But if I want to find a drawable, it's actually going to be in the drawable folder. Or if I want to find a mip map, it's going to be in the mip map folder. So it may tell you the name of the folder, or it may tell you the name of the file under the values folder, depending on what kind of resource it is. Okay. The other style that you'll see is if you wanted to find an ID, every every view typically should have a have an ID or more specifically, the ones you want to interact with in code need to have an ID. We typically don't give our layouts an ID. Um, it's going to look like this. So it's going to start with an at sign, and then a plus ID, and then after that is the actual ID. right? So this first part is just fluff. Always has to be there. 
the second the part after that slash is the actual ID. Does that make sense? Okay. So if I want to say create a control encode, okay, I can do that. Um, the way I would do that is I would first create a variable. In this case, I'm going to call it my text. I'm going to say text view my text is equal to new text view. So here I'm making a new text view control. Now, just to be clear, this is not visible to the UI yet. I've created the text view object, but it's not actually visible yet. Okay? So that's not actually been shown to the user. So I can create it. I can set the text on it. Okay, cool. Um, one thing to know in here, every time I create a view, I need to give it a context, right? Let's talk about this briefly. But in this case, this, this refers to the activity you're on. So it has a link to the current activity. Make sense? So a link to the screen that you're going to display it on. Is there any benefit to creating it in code versus creating it in a graphic? You should always you do it in XML. I mean, like, like how we're dragging, like when we like, drag a button onto. Yes, that's yeah. what I'm saying. You should do the drag and drop oh. to make the XML file. Okay. You should do it in the designer. This is for the purpose of kind of understanding what's going on mm -hmm. more than this being something you want to do. Okay. So, more, the only reason I'm going through this is because you kind of want to know what your layouts, how is actually turning this layout into code. Because it does have to take your your layout file and turn it into code, turn it into Java code. Um, context, as you saw previously, there is an argument that gets used a lot. Okay, so there's actually a call class in Android called context, um, and you'll see that come up a lot. Okay, so if I want to get the activity context, it's referred to as the activity context, I'm just going to get that as this. The current activity object is also acts as a context. It's a subclass of context. If I want to get the application wide context instead of the specific activity context, I'm going to say get application context. Okay, so get application context becomes application context. If I'm just using this, I'm talking about the activity context. Okay, that the difference between the application context and the activity context won't really matter with where we're at right now. Um, where we get into the application context will be when we start dealing with background services and databases and the like. Um, so once we start with those things where potentially things are happening outside of a single screen, that's when we'll start talking about the application context. Does that make sense? Um, so keep that in mind. We will come back to that later. Um, so that's that's what we're doing here. Is we're giving the, the text view our current context. Okay. If you're looking at all the classes that are in the Android API, there's uh, over a hundred different subclasses of view class. There are a lot of different views. There are a lot of different widgets that you can use in the API, and you can also create your own. Um, and you can find views that other people have created on the internet. So um, those are things that that make the the framework very extensible, right? You can create your own subclasses of existing controls or create custom controls, both of which I've I've actually had to do professionally because um, there are some things that weren't weren't available in the in the system as is. Um, so dealing with view groups. So view groups are groups of view. They're able to they're able to render what we call child views. So we call them parents, and we call the views that are assigned them. We call them child children. So the the constraint route is that first one, which is going to again position controls relative to each other. That's the main one we want to use. We've got the scroll view, which can contain a single view inside of it and makes it now scrollable. Um, and then we've also got, for instance, the recycler view, which we'll see in a week or two that we'll deal with scrolling through a list of buttons. Um, there's an older view in the framework called list view, which we don't use anymore and strongly recommend against using it. 
but it's kind of the predecessor to recycler view. Um, so layouts. Layouts are a specific kind of view group. Um, they're all, all the layouts are a subclass of view group. Um, they can contain child views. Um, there's a bunch of different ways that they can represent um, how the layouts are rendered. So for instance, we're seeing a linear layout is going to render them in a line, either a horizontal line or a vertical line. And straight layout, you can basically do anything you want. We just connect things to each other, and, and you can actually pretty much build anything using that in a straight layout. Um, we've also got grid layouts. Um, grid layouts, unfortunately, grid layouts, as it turns out, are actually a combination of linear layouts. Um, they're more efficient, they're better than, than just using linear layouts by itself, but they're actually just a combination. It's literally implemented as a combination of linear layouts, um, which means they're actually not very efficient. Um, so it's actually better to use a constraint layout over a grid layout, just for efficiency's sake. Um, it may be fine if you only have, if they're kind of showing 16 blocks here, 16 blocks or less, you may be okay with a grid layout if that's really what you need, but I generally recommend going ahead and going with the constraint layout simply because then you have the flexibility if you ever want to do something different. Um, there's also something called the table layout, um, which we will do hardly anything with again because constraint layout just does everything better um, than, than the table layout used to do. A lot of these different layouts exist because initially we didn't have constraint layout. As I said previously, constraint layout's only about five years old. Um, so if we're using a constraint layout, I'll connect things up, linear layouts in a line, relative layout, basically the older kind of version of constraint layout. <coughs> and then we've got table and, and frame layouts. Frame layouts are still helpful because they show everything as a stack on top of each other. So that's one of those things that constraint layout can't do, actually, is stack things on top of each other. It doesn't do that well. So if you do need to, for some reason, stack things on top of each other, keep frame layout in mind. Um, but the thing about frame layout is everything has to be that full size of the, the container. So there's only so much you can do with it. When we're talking about a hierarchy, there's two different hierarchies you have to keep in mind. So there's a class hierarchy and there's a layout hierarchy, right? So when we're talking about the class hierarchy, we're talking about how what's the relationship between the, the, the individual the class, the different types of controls that exist, right? So for instance, if I'm looking at the class hierarchy here, it's going to look like this, where I say, well, text view extends view, button extends text view extends view, right? All that stuff refers to as the class hierarchy. But we also have the layout hierarchy, which is sometimes referred as the view hierarchy, which has to do with how they're visually arranged. Okay, And primarily, it has to do with how they're arranged in your XML file. Okay, What things are inside of each other in terms of parent-child relationships. So at the root of every activity that we have, we'll always have some sort of view. You always have to have a new group at the root. Um, so typically that's going to be your constraint layout or your, your linear layout or your frame layout. Um, but that has to always be a group. Okay? So beneath the view group, we can have other views or even further view groups. Split it in, break it up further. So I can have one layout container here and then have another layer container in it further if I need to do some more layout down that way. So I can have things like, okay, let's have a linear layout first that's vertical, and then one of those lines in there is going to be a horizontal linear layout. So, so you can see things like that. Okay. So for instance, the, the app that we were just working with, with Hello Toast, we can kind of break it up like this. So it's got a linear layout on the outside, that linear layout then contains a button, a text view, and another button. Right? So these are all these three are children's children of the linear layout. So we can kind of diagram the view hierarchy like 
Okay. Your view hierarchy matters a lot in terms of the performance and the complexity of your application. So the deeper your view hierarchy is, the slower your application will get. That makes sense? The more layers you add, the slower it will be because every layer requires a significant amount of work. Um, so that's one of the upsides to the constraint layout is you can actually speed up your app by just using the constraint layout because you can actually reduce the number of layers that you need oftentimes using a constraint layout instead of say using a bunch of linear layouts. So if we've got a linear, if we've got again the same linear layout here, you can see that new hierarchy in the designer in that bottom left corner. So here you can see that they're underneath the linear layout and we can see what order they're in. Okay. There's how the XML would look. Again, we've kind of seen this already. We've got the layout on the outside. We've got the orientation set to vertical and we've got a button, a text view, and then a button. Now, let's say I want to create something like this in code. Okay. If I want to create something like this in code, I first need to create the layout. So I'm going to say create a new linear layout object. Again, I have to give it a context. So I'm going to give it this. I'm going to set the orientation of that layout to be vertical. I'm going to create a new text view. Okay, so now I have a linear layout and I have a text view, but they're just floating off there in space, right? They actually aren't connected to anything and the user can't see them. So if I want to get to the place where the user can see them, first of all, I need to say layout, add view. So I need to add the, the control, add the text view to the layout. Okay, well, so now the, the text view is part of the layout, but the layout's still not visible, right? So then finally, I need to say set content view and give it the layout to render. Okay, so conceptually, you can kind of see all of the stuff that's happening. When I say set content view and give it a layout resource, right, give it that extra mile part, it's doing all this. See that? And this process is what we call inflation. All this process that we're doing here, we're inflating the layout. We're taking it and we're turning it into actual view objects. So if we want to set the width or the height of an item of a view in code, we use a layout parameter object to do that. So in this case, I'm using a linear layout dot layout parameters. So every layout has a different set of layout parameters. So if we want to change those, we need to use a specific one for that layout. So there's a constraint layout dot layout parameters. There's a linear layout dot layout parameters. There's a relative layout dot layout parameters. It all depends on what layout your view is actually in. So I can set in the layout parameters, for instance, here I can set the, the width and the height. Um, so I'm setting the width to match parent. I'm setting the um, the height to match content, that should probably be wrap content, honestly, right here. Not match content. That should be wrap content. So kind of best practices for managing that view hierarchy or, or layout hierarchy. Um, is, is again, you want to make you want to know that that does affect the app performance. The deeper it is, the slower it will be. So we want to use as minimum possible views and and view groups as we can. Um, so we don't want to nest a bunch of a bunch of layers inside of it. And again, constraint layouts kind of the quickest way to make that happen. Okay, so working with the constraint layout kind of dealt with that already. Um, again, looking in the layout designer, and you'll see there's two toolbars. The first one is that general toolbar that it shows up all the time. The second toolbar is specific to the constraint layout. So if you're running in a different in a different layout container, whether it be the linear layout, relative layout, you may see a different toolbar in that second bar. Does that make sense? Um, 
the auto connect tool you can kind of see a gif on the right um, of how that's working a gif of how it's working um, you just kind of drag it in and in theory it'll kind of lock into place and create those connections for you um, but I haven't had great luck for it which is part of the reason why it, in older versions of Android Studio it actually used to be turned on by default and you'll notice that it's not turned on by default anymore um, because there's been some issues with it um, so different ways to resize kind of gone over that already again remember if you want to align something by baseline they've moved where that is so you'll need to right click the view to get that baseline handle um, there's attributes there bane as well if we're looking over on the right in the attributes pane um, a few things to call to your attention so first what you see here remember that's the quick way to cycle through the different height modes that you can have you can have the the three different height modes or you can click this button to cycle through the three different width modes um, there's also a button up on the top which the icons changed it looks like an underscore now which will minimize the attribute window over to the right if you do need more space okay so the three different modes for the width and height that you'll see this icon right here means that it's set to match constraint this icon means set to wrap content. This icon means it's set to a fixed number. You generally want to make sure it's one of these two. Okay, that makes sense? So again, you can click on it and it will cycle those three modes. Um, edit attributes, we've seen kind of how to do that. It used to be that the way you got to more attributes kind of functioned in a different way so it had this icon to switch but now all the more attributes is that expandable section down at the bottom okay then we looked at that as well so we looked at how to switch between landscape portrait yesterday and um, you saw that under the the change the orientation button um, that you can create a landscape variation there um, and you also saw that we can create a tablet version there okay um, and that created it under a folder called land this one created under a folder called sw600 dp so it used to be that in older versions of android um, rather than going by like smallest width which is a relatively newer kind of thing um, there used to be these buckets of, si of device sizes. Um, so if you're running on an older version of, if you're running in an older version of Android Studio, or you have maybe set your minimum version to a lower number, when you create that tablet variation, you may see it created like this as, as extra large or such. Um, that's not recommended that you use that anymore. So, so we've recommended to kind of switch over to smallest width instead of um, or smallest dimension rather than those groups so dealing with events um, oftentimes we want to deal with what happens when the user does X Y or Z um, so it, that may be from the user that may be clicks and taps or, or dragging on the UI with their finger um, it also could be things that are kind of considered detected activities. So the device may detect that you're walking or it might detect that you're driving. It might detect that you're, you're tilting the device. And, and they're conceptually, they're noticed by the system. The system picks it up from the center and sensors and then passes it on to us. So we say, when that happens, tell us about it. And then we'll do our thing. So what we write is event handlers. Um, event handlers, anything that we want to say, okay, this code runs when X, Y, or Z happens. So we create an event handler, which is sort of like a function, and say run this function in response to this event. Okay, so we've seen this way of setting up a handler already. So in the XML, I can say Android on click, show toast, and then I go create a method on the activity called show toast right and again if I'm doing it this way for the click event it needs to take a view 
which the view is the is the button or control that you interacted with. It's the control that you clicked on. Um, and then it needs to return void. Okay, so that's the signature that's required. That's what that input is. It's the in it's the thing you clicked on. Okay. Um, it's also possible to write it in set up set the that listener entirely in code. So here is the old way of doing it. Okay. The old way of doing it would say, okay, well, let's get it. And this typic, this code would typically go into on create. So in on create, first they get the control, save it to an instance variable, and then I get it, cast it, and then I'm going to say button set on click listener. Okay, set on click listener. I'm going to say new view on click listener. Okay. So this view.onClickListener, that is an interface. And view.onClickListener is an interface. I can dynamically create a subclass or an anonymous subclass that implements that interface. Anonymous class that implements that interface using this syntax. So this is what we call in Java an inline class. Okay? So an inline class that implements that interface. Well, that interface only has one method, onClick UV, okay, and returns void. So it's got that same signature as we saw previously. It's got an onClick method, has to be called onClick, takes the view or the button you clicked on, and doesn't return it. Okay, so I can manually hook this up in code without hooking up the listener in the LAMP. Does that make sense? Sometimes I may need to do that. This is the old syntax. Okay, this is the way you used to do it. For for new code, this is not the way you want to write this. Okay, so remember when we were look, going through Java, I mentioned something about we were talking about lambdas, right? So I can create a lambda. Um, I can create a, a what do we call it? A function object. So I can create a lambda, um, and specifically when I'm doing that, that only that works with interfaces. Remember, interfaces that have one method. Okay, so I can use lambdas with interfaces that have one method. See, I've got an interface here that has one method. So I can use a lambda to simplify this. So specifically, this part that says new view on click listener, I don't want to have to write that every time. I want to have to say public void on click. There's a lot of extra stuff that I have to write in here, which makes this a lot harder to read. Okay, so here's how we write it nowadays. Okay, here's how you want to hook up a, a, a listener in code with the current Java syntax. Okay, so we don't need to do a cast anymore because that's been fixed for changes to generics. Um, and the way I declare this first part, I'm going to just say uv arrow body. You see how that's a lot less code. Um, I think in this case they're optional. They're optional because I only have one input. Although I think if I don't leave them in there, I have to just save them. I'm not so sure about that, but I think I may have to just save them and I can't specify what that is. But again, that's something I have to do. But typically that's how that works. Does that make sense? You can see how that's a lot less code to write out. In fact, if you do have this, the previous syntax show, Android Studio will actually basically suggest that you convert it to the other. Um, in fact, if you look at that, actually, if you were to type this in, it would kind of hide these first parts to try and make it easier to read. So, so Android Studio will actually recommend you switching from this to the other version. Okay, so dealing with resources. So resources are separate static pieces. Um, yeah, so they may be used, but they may generally are used in your layouts. They may actually be used in your code as well, but they're generally static resources. So, and the fact that they're static 
is important. Like I was mentioning when we were talking about earlier, can the user change these values? No, they can't. So let's say you want the user to be able to upload images, provide their own images from a camera or something else. Well, that's not going to come in as a resource, right? Because it came from the user, right? It's not static, right? So anything that's a resource is something that we provided to them as a developer. It has to already be built into the app. Okay. Um, so that includes all the things that we've seen so far. So strings, dimensions, images, menus, colors, stylings. Um, and one of the big benefits of breaking all these things into resources is it does make it a lot easier to localize it. So I can have one version that works, say, and for the US and another work version for Mexico and another version for China. So all of these resource files will be under the res folder. Now, sometimes you may see two res folders, one that says generated and one that doesn't say generated. Stick to the one that doesn't say generated. Okay. So if I want to use some of these resources in code, I can refer to, say, layout. It's going to be something like this, r.layout.com. Activity main. So you can see the first part of this is always R, which is that generated resource class. Every app gets their own R class that's generated based on the resources they have. So you're going to say R, then the type of resource that it is, and then the ID of the resource. So R.layout.activity.main, all of these constants give you a name. They never actually give you objects. Okay. Or if I wanted to refer to an ID, I could say r.id recycler view. If I want to refer to a string, it's going to be r.string.title. Or if I want to refer to that in XML, it's going to be at string title. Okay. Now, one very important thing to understand. We kind of mentioned this briefly, but I want to talk about, talk about it a little bit more in depth. So we've seen there's two units that we use in Android. We use DP for density pixels or density independent pixels, or we do SP, which are scale independent scale, scale independent pixels. They call. I think they're actually. I think that's probably more a misnomer, and they should actually be scale dependent pixels. I think that's a typo on those slides. So. Um, things we don't use as we're working with Android. Um, you may remember as you were building up websites, there's a lot of measurements that we can use on, on the web and use in CSS. So, for instance, you may have used a lot of pixels okay, or a lot of points for font sizes. Right? Um, those are strongly discouraged in the world of Android. They are still available. Okay, I can still say this is 3px. That's still valid syntax. I can say that this is this font size potentially is a three point or twelve point or ten point. We don't want to use those, however, in the world of Android. Okay, and that has to do with the the vast amount of differences between different Android devices and different screens. Okay, so for instance, which I'll, we'll, we'll talk about in a minute. Um, there are devices where, let's say I have a tablet, 10-inch tablet. So if I were to take a 10-inch tablet, um, a, a Samsung Tab 3, okay, and look at the, the size of its pixels and how many pixels it has, and compare that to, say, a Nexus 4. Okay? Uh, a Nexus 4, actually, which is 4 inches, right, has more pixels than a big 10-inch tablet, than a big Samsung Tab 3. It may seem con con that may seem kind of backwards. You'd expect the bigger the physical screen size, the more pixels it is. That's not at all true when we deal with Android devices. It, it's entirely possible that this little bitty phone may have more pixels than your tablet. That happens a lot. Okay? So we don't want to use pixels because they're a very bad sort of approximation. Um, we also want to stay away from actual physical measurements 
like inches and millimeters and centimeters and, and the like, because um, they don't end up working out all that well. Um, simply because when these devices are calibrated, um, we'll, we'll kind of walk through it, but they're given a kind of a, a density group. Okay? Now, pixel density or DPI, anybody remember how you calculate that? You, if any, ever had to go through calculating that? Okay. Let's talk about DPI real quick. Okay. If I take some, if I take a screen, a space of physical space, take some physical space. Okay. So let's say this is my space here. Okay. And let's say I've blown this up. So this right here, each side is one inch. So I've got one inch on this side and one inch on that side, right? Okay. So I break this up like so. And say each of these squares here can be a different color. Well, we call that a pixel, right? So a pixel can be any color I want it to. So in this case, how many pixels do I have here? I've got four pixels, right? So look along the dimensions, right? So vertically, there are two pixels per inch. See that? Two pixels an inch. Here there's two pixels per inch. So in this case, in this in this setup, I've got a DPI of two. Or, or this is two pixels per inch. That's how I measure DPI, is in dots per inch, or screen density. How many pixels does it have per inch? If I expand that, and we say, oh, let's put a bunch more pixels in there. So each pixel is half a square inch? Yes. So in this case, each pixel would be a half square inch. But we do the inverse of that, right? So there's two pixels per inch. Because mm -hmm. there's usually a lot more pixels than there are inches. Right. So if I say, let's put this in here, and let's say I've got 10 lines there, well, then I might have, and 10 here, well, then I might have, this is 10 pixels per inch. So density is a measure of how many pixels do I have per distance or per area. Does that make sense? But it's measured along a side. Okay? Does that make sense? Now, at the moment, I'm assuming they're square. I'm assuming that all pixels are square. Okay. Now, I'll show you a little bit of video dealing with. Let's go through. Okay. So, this is going to talk a bit about how. DP works and how it fits in with Android. Okay, now I think I need to make sure I've got audio working. Yep, that's right. Hold on. And go on the box. Yeah, that's plugged in. 